Michael Mann is one of the world's leading climate scientists. His hockey stick graph depicting the effect of climate change and global warming became a defining symbol of Mann's influence on the environment. We talked earlier and I asked the director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State to, uh, to begin by asking him about the impact of climate change deniers. Well, you know, the evidence uh, for uh, human influence on, on the climate, um, for human-caused global warming and climate change just becomes stronger with each uh, additional year uh, of data that we have that, that comes in that tells us that indeed we're seeing unprecedented warmth, we are seeing unprecedented uh, melt of, of sea ice up in the Arctic. Uh, so the evidence gets stronger and stronger um, and the scientific community, if you look at various uh, assessments of uh, where scientific opinion stands, um, something like 99% of scientists who work in this area agree with the consensus view that climate change is real, it's caused by us, and it represents a threat if we don't do something about it. Unfortunately, we do see some intransigence in the political sphere. Here in the U.S., we have a House of Representatives with a science committee that is led by a Republican politicians who don't even accept that climate change is real. So there's this huge gulf between where the science is, um, the science says this is a problem we need to deal with, and where our politics are. Uh, we're at a bit of a stalemate right now here in the U.S. One of the things that doesn't help is that uh, there is this discussion about a pause in the rate of global warming. Can you address that, whether you think it's real or not? Sure. I wrote a, an article in the, the, recent, uh, the most recent issue of Scientific American uh, that I wanted to call faux pause. Um, it, it's about the fact that uh, there is no pause in global warming. We're seeing more and more heat uh, accumulating in the ocean. As I said before, we're seeing record uh, levels of melt of Arctic sea ice. And what happens is there are fluctuations from year to year in the average temperature of the Earth. And those fluctuations have to do with random events like El Nino, uh, volcanic eruptions. There are all sorts of things that can lead to year-to-year -year fluctuations in temperature. But when we step back and we look at you know, the global average temperature trends over decades, we see the last decade was the warmest on record. A year ago, we actually had the warmest year on record here in the U.S. Uh, just this last year, Australia had the warmest year they've ever seen. So no, climate change and global warming continues unabated, despite the fact that there are year-to-year -year fluctuations in, you know, in temperature. And so uh, as the science kind of lines up all on one side, and as you say, much of the politics stays on the other side, what do you see as the tipping factor, that point that will actually force the policies in the, in the direction of climate change? Well, you know, we, we talk about two different kinds of tipping points um, in this problem. First, uh, there are the scientific uh, tipping points. There are the climate tipping points. Will we commit to a level of uh, dangerous interference with the climate that commits us to rapid melting of the ice sheets, uh, to uh, abrupt changes in, in drought patterns. Um, the fear is that we may approach one of these climate tipping points before we approach the other tipping point, the tipping point in the, in the public consciousness, the recognition that we are, uh, through the emissions that we're making right now, we are locking in global warming and climate change for decades to come. And if we don't put our foot on the brake now, if we don't bring our emissions to a peak and begin to ramp them down, we will likely commit to what can reasonably be described as dangerous and potentially irreversible changes in climate. So we need that tipping point. We need something that will galvanize the public uh, around the task, around the challenge. And it's a welcome challenge to, you know, shift away from our reliance on fossil fuels towards a clean energy economy. We know it'll be good for our economy. It'll be good for the planet. It is, of course, not good in the short term for economies like Canada's, uh, extremely reliant on fossil fuels for a big chunk of our GDP. What would be the kind of argument you would make to countries like ours and the entrenched interest everywhere uh, in the existing infrastructure of the fossil fuel economy? Sure. You know, uh, our former president, uh, George W. Bush, uh, described uh, the U.S. as a country that is addicted to fossil fuels. Um, and we are. And, and, and Canada, you know, we, both of us uh, have um, had this legacy of, of centuries of uh, relying on, on fossil fuel energy, on cheap but dirty fossil fuel energy. And we are now starting, uh, unfortunately, to see 
the negative impacts of, of that legacy. Uh, and by most calculations, right now, the damage being done by climate change, whether it's in the form of more extreme weather events of certain types, of increased uh, coastal flooding uh, because of global sea level rise, uh, increased uh, drought in many parts of, of the country, uh, increased wildfire. Uh, by any measure, the cost right now of climate change related damages is, is something like 1% uh, of global gross domestic uh, product. It's already more than the cost of taking action. So already not taking action is a more expensive proposition than taking action, than mitigating our, our carbon emissions, than, than putting in place a price on the emission of carbon so that we level the playing field for other non-carbon based energy to compete in the global marketplace. Um, it's a no-brainer when you look at the cost of inaction, it's far greater than any cost of action, whether you're the U.S. or Canada or any other country. All right, we've got to leave it there, Michael. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. Michael Mann is author of The Hockey Stick and The Climate Wars.